All right, everybody, welcome to Math with Grace. Today we're going to be going through pre-calculus, Unit 3, Section 3. Section 3 begins on page 42, and it's called The Reciprocal Functions and Identities. It says, trig tables of values were developed because the need, because of need, and were based on geometric principles. While the Greeks were using trigonometric functions in the second century BC, the reciprocal trig functions were not introduced until navigators began to use the secant tables in the fifth, 15th century, okay? So um, I know I highlighted some of the vocabulary, but over here sums it up pretty good. The sine, cosine, and tangent functions each have a reciprocal function. The secant, abbreviated SEC, is the reciprocal of the cosine function. The cosecant is CSC, and it's the reciprocal of the sine function. The cotangent is the reciprocal of the tangent function, COT. And they look like this, okay? The secant is equal to one over the cosine, which if we break down cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse, right? If you flip it, the secant is equal to the hypotenuse over the adjacent, right? The reciprocal of the cosine. The cosecant then is hypotenuse over opposite and the cotangent is adjacent over opposite, okay? And these are just saying, they're this key point here is just talking about how they're co-functions. So this section here tells us how to use our calculator to solve for this by using the cosine to the negative one, but that is, that button is not the correct button. You know, we have the sine negative one, cosine negative one, tangent negative one. We've been using those for um, having the decimal value and going back right to the uh, degree value. But looking at this example here in this chart, this chart is set up just like the other chart was for the 30, 45, 60 degree angles, right? Gave us the measurements, right? Here's the cosine of a 30 degree. There is the sine of a 30 degree. And here's the tangent of a 30 degree um, and so on and so forth, right? And then we take the reciprocal to get our secant, cosecant, and cotangent. But here's how you can do this on your calculator. I know that this calculator has the button and so does the Texas Instrument. So if we put in, let's just look at this one, right? The cosecant of 30 degrees is the reciprocal of the sine of 30 degrees. So if we put in sine 30, close your parentheses, and then hit this X to the negative one button, it puts the little negative one up there and then you can hit equals and you can see that you come up with the correct answer, okay? The button is exactly the same on, <clears throat> excuse me, on this Texas instrument. It looks like this, X to the negative one um, and it should work just the same, okay? So as I was saying, these are the ones that you can find exact va values for, okay? 30, 45, and 60 because you know the exact trig function for the sine, cosine, and tangent, which like I said, is these little ones that they've listed here. Okay, one half three, square root of three, square root of three, okay? So this chart here that they've made for you will be important going forward. So like I say, you don't always have to memorize things, but it's good to know where they are or maybe make a photocopy uh, so that you can keep it with you as you go forward. It says the approach for finding the exact value of a reciprocal function is as follows. Determine the quadrant in which the angle terminates, just like we have been so far. Determine the sine of the function in that quadrant. Determine the reference angle, and it says it may help to find the coterminal, so just find the reference angle. Evaluate the original, original function and then the reciprocated. Okay, find the original function value and then take the reciprocal and then state the value with the correct sign. Now, obviously, taking a reciprocal, or when you reciprocate a number, you do not change the sign. The sign doesn't change. The reciprocal function has the same sign as the original function. So our um, little cheater that says all students take calculus, that still applies, except when it's students, right, in the second quadrant, sign, is positive, well, then so is the cosecant function, right? That's just how that works. Okay, let's turn the page. 
We have a couple examples and then we dive right into the schoolwork. But let's take a look at this. Find the exact value of the cosecant of 300 degrees, okay? It says the angle terminates in quadrant four, right? If you think about where that goes. The sine function is negative quadrant four, so the cosecant is also going to be negative in quadrant four. They find their reference angle of 60 degrees, and then they find the sine of 60 degrees. Of course, it's negative because we are have a negative answer, right? So negative square root of three over two, and then they take the reciprocal. Now, when you take the reciprocal, you get negative two over the square root of three, right? But we can't have a square root of three in the denominator. So they multiplied, uh, multiplied it by a factor of one in the form of the square root of three over the square root of three, and that's how they got negative two times the square root of three over three. All right, that's how they, that's how you do it, right? We can't have a square root in the denominator. For this next example, it says find the exact value of the cotangent of negative 135. Now remember, when we're doing a negative angle, that means it's traveling this way. Okay, it would be somewhere over here in the third quadrant. Uh, the tangent's positive in the third quadrant, so the cotangent is also going to be positive. They find their reference angle. It says it's coterminal with 225 degrees, okay? But the reference angle is 45, which you could have figured out just by taking 180 and subtracting 135. You would have gotten 45, and that's our, that's our reference angle right here. So we want the cotangent of 45, okay? The tangent of 45 degrees is one. You take the reciprocal of one is just one, right? So they're both one at that stage. Okay, let's take a look at a couple of these problems. Let's start over here with number four. For number four, it says, which of the following angles can be used to evaluate the secant of 120 degrees? Okay, 120 degrees is coming this way, right? What is its reference angle is basically what they're asking us. What is 180 minus 120? Well, it's a 60 degree angle. So the reference angle is 60 degrees, so the answer is C. Okay, let's take a look at number, there's a few more like that. Let's take a look at number nine though. Evaluate the cosecant of 330 degrees. Now remember the cosecant is the sine is the reciprocal of the sine and 330 degrees tells me it's coming pretty far this way and the reference angle how much further to get to 360 well it would be 30 degrees right so i'm looking for the reciprocal of the sine of 30 degrees now in that quadrant our sine is negative right so what is the sine of 30 degrees? Looking at the chart, we can find that it's going to be one half. So now we need the reciprocal of one half, which is just a negative two. So the answer is B. What about this one, number 10? Evaluate the cotangent of 405 degrees. Now, negative, sorry, negative 405 degrees, which tells me it goes around this way, but it passes one whole revolution, right? and it ends up down here somewhere. Now, 360 minus 405, or 405 minus 360, is 45 degrees, okay? So cotangent tells me I want the tangent of 45 degrees. The tangent in quadrant four is negative. So what is the tangent of 45 degrees? We already looked at that one over here in this example. And it's one, so here it would be negative one. The reciprocal of that is still going to be a negative one, so the answer is C. All right, so these aren't entirely challenging, okay? Finding the reciprocal of something is something you should be comfortable with. If not, make sure you're contacting me. We can go over it more in depth. But remember, the reciprocal of three-fourths is just going to be four-thirds. Okay, we're flipping and exchanging the numerator for the denominator, okay? The numerator goes down, denominator goes up, and we end up with three-fourths. Okay, I guess they're not equal, but that's how you find your reciprocal, okay? 
So that's all we're doing is just flipping it over. When we flip this over, we got a negative two over one, right? Which is just a negative two. When you flip over a negative one, it's still just a negative one. So some of them are pretty simple. Some of them are a little bit more complicated, but I think we can go through these on our own. And if you have a question, let me know. Come back and meet me for the next part of this section. The next part of this section starts on page 46 and it's titled Points on the Terminal Side. Now it says, there's a lot here. I'm gonna go ahead and just read it real quick. Um, I don't normally do that, but there wasn't one specific thing that I thought to highlight because all of it seemed, I don't know, relatively interesting or important. It says, it's impossible to draw a triangle having an acute angle measure of zero degrees. And trig functions have been defined as ratios of sides in a right triangle. So you might wonder how it is that we have sine and cosine values for zero degrees. There are also trig function values of angles that are undefined. Try evaluating the tangent of 90 degrees on a calculator. While trigonometry is the study of relationships among sides and angles in triangles, much of its history involves astronomy and circular paths. The Greeks used chords in a circle to help them in their study of astronomy. The ancient table of chords later became the table of sine values. Since trigonometry is a branch of geometry, many geometric principles were used in its development. The geometric properties of similar features and circles will help you to better understand trigonometric functions. Okay, like I said, somewhat relevant. All right, quadrantal angles, quadrantal angles, such a weird word. Quadrantal angles do not terminate in a quadrant, but rather between the quadrants. They terminate on an axis, okay? So, knowing that our unit circle has a radius of one, for zero, the coordinates of the point are one comma zero, right? This is zero degrees. Now remember, these points are set up as cosine of theta comma sine of theta, right? So the cosine of zero degrees is one and the sine of zero degrees is zero, right? For the 90 degrees, the point is zero comma one, 180 is negative one comma zero, and 270 is zero comma negative one. And then on the next page, the top of the next page, I should say, page 47, it says, remember the cosine sine, right? So we know the sine and the cosine for each of those degrees. Now, because some of them are zero, when we go to find the tangent, we get some undefined things. We get a couple of zeros and we get a couple of undefineds because zero divided by something is zero, but something divided by zero is undefined. So we have tangent of zero at zero, tangent of 90 undefined, tangent at 180 zero, tangent at 270 undefined. So when um, the tangent is a horizontal, it's zero. When it's on the vertical axis, the y-axis, it is undefined, okay? Looking at some of these examples. It says the terminal side of an angle in a standard position passes through the point negative nine comma 12. Find the exact value. So remember, we don't want like long st strung out decimals, right? We're looking for a fraction usually. So find the exact value of the six trigonometric function values of the angle. Okay, so they're looking for a lot of information here. Their suggestion is to sketch the graph. When we sketch the graph, we know the X value and we know the Y value. The point is at negative nine, 12. We can also set up this triangle and see that we can use the Pythagorean theorem to solve for the radius of this particular angle, okay? And that radius is 15, right? Nine squared plus 12 squared equals 225. Square root of that is 15. Now we know the radius. Let's turn the page for the rest of the examples finished over there. So here we go. Now that we know that we have the opposite side is 12, the adjacent side is nine, and the hypotenuse is 15, we can do the cosine, sine, and tangent, and then take the reciprocal for the other three. 
Okay, so if the cosine is negative 9 of 15, because remember, we have, we're in quadrant 2, then the secant is 15 ninths. If the sine is 12 15 then the cosecant is 15 twelfths. If the tangent is negative 12 ninths, the cotangent is negative 9 twelfths. Okay, so we just have to find the other side, and then we can determine the exact answer for each of these. For this section right here, they say if the sine of theta is equal to negative 3 over 5, determine the cosine and the tangent values. Well, because our sine value is negative both in the third and the fourth quadrant, we actually have two possible angle measurements. So they have those set up here, and this graph isn't exactly neatly marked, but we don't know what the x value is because remember, when we're talking about sine, we have opposite over hypotenuse. So we know that we're going down 3 and that our hypotenuse is 5. And then here we went down 3 and our hypotenuse is 5, but we're not sure what our x value is yet. Okay, So just like the last one, to solve for that, we have to do the Pythagorean theorem. Okay, So 3 square or x or a squared right plus three negative three squared is equal to five squared and solving that they get x squared equal to 16 and therefore x could be a plus or minus four because remember we're talking about our x value so that's probably why they use x so x could be a positive four and then down three or x could be a negative four and then down three so then solving and this goes back up to the top of the next column Solving for the what they asked for was the cosine and the tangent. In quadrant three, the cosine would be a negative four fifths, and the tangent would be a positive three fourths. In quadrant four, the cosine would be a positive four fifths, and the tangent would be negative, right? We have to watch our signs. So when they're asking you a question like this, make sure you're following your signs, All right? This next example here, we're going to take a look at, and then we'll do some problems. It says angle theta is in the standard position. If the tangent of theta is negative 5 twelfths and the cosine of theta is less than zero, which means it's negative, find all the trigonometric functions of theta. Okay, so the fact that they gave us an extra piece helps us to narrow down the quadrant because our tangent is negative in the second and the fourth, okay? But our cosine is only negative in the of, of the second and the fourth. The cosine is only going to be negative in the second, right? Because in the fourth, our cosine is positive. So this has to be in the second quadrant, and that's how they determine that. The tangent, remember, is opposite over adjacent, so that gave us these two parts. To find all of the trigonometric functions, we need to use the Pythagorean theorem to solve for our radius, which is 13. And then they set up all of the trigonometric functions, right? Cosine, sine, tangent, and then the reciprocal of each. Okay. Make, make sure you're watching your signs when you're doing these. We are going to turn to page 50 and do a couple problems together. These I think you can handle on your own. Number 20 on page 50. An angle, theta, is in standard position. The terminal side of the angle passes through the point 4, 5, and they want us to find the cosine of theta. So standard position, uh, 4, 5 is right here-ish, right? And we went over 4, and we went up 5, right? That's how the point system works, right? Coordinate plane, x value, y value. So what is the cosine of theta? Well, the cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse. We don't have the hypotenuse, so we have to figure that out. So 4 squared plus 5 squared is equal to r squared. Technically, it's, they call it the radius, right? So this is 16 plus 25 is equal to r squared. Uh, 1, 41 is equal to r squared. So r is equal to the square root of 41. They want the exact answer here. So we're not going to change the fact that this is the square root of 41. Now, for the cosine, we want adjacent 
over the hypotenuse or over the radius, which is the square root of 41. We can't have a square root in our denominator, so we're going to multiply this by 1 in the form of 40, square root of 41 over square root of 41. So it's going to equal 4 times the square root of 41 over 41, okay, which is answer C. Right? Always, I always suggest doing the drawing. It helps us to see what's happening, right? The cosine is positive in section one or quadrant one. Everything is positive in quadrant one, right? Number 21. An angle theta is in standard position. The terminal side of the angle passes through the point negative five, negative three. Find the tangent of theta. Okay. Negative five, negative three is going to be somewhere over here. Okay. And so this is negative five. This is my negative three. Okay. They want the tangent of theta. That's pretty simple because they've already given us enough information. Remember, tangent is opposite over adjacent. So it's negative three over a negative five. Quadrant three, tangent is positive. So it's a positive three fifths. That one was pretty simple. All right. There's a couple more here uh, for you to do on your own. Go ahead and do that and meet me back here for the last part of section three. This last part of section three begins on page 51, and it is the Pythagorean identities. It says the sum of the squares of the cosine of an angle and the sine of that angle, same angle, is equal to one. And so that's our jumping off point for these identities, okay? It says you should already be familiar with some relationships that exist. We already are, we've done a lot of these already. They're called identities. Um, these are the secant, cosecant, cotangent ones we just studied. Um, so we're going to turn the page. Top of page 52, we get our Pythagorean, Pythor Pythagorean, Pythagorean, Pythagorean theory, Pythagorean identities. At the top of page 52, we get the Pythagorean identities, okay? And that tells us that the cosine of theta, the quantity squared, not the theta squared, but the quantity squared, plus the quantity sine theta squared is equal to one. Okay, and it's saying here, be careful with your parentheses. So instead of writing it like that, you could write it like this, where cosine squared of theta, because we don't wanna square the theta, plus the sine squared of theta is equal to one. So these are some important, important identities. There's like a little review box up here. So all of them are put together. The next, they tested here, right? Verify the identity. We'll just look at it real quick. Cosine squared of theta plus sine squared of theta equals one for theta equals 30 degrees, okay? The cosine of 30 degrees is square root of three over two. The sine of 30 degrees is one half. They're squaring those two things, okay? And they end up with three fourths plus one fourth which is one. So it is true that these things exist. This key point says, make sure you're using the same angle each time. The angle that you square for the cosine needs to be the angle you square for the sine, otherwise it doesn't work. This is cosine of theta and sine of beta. We don't wanna do that, okay? That's not what we're doing. All right, the next identity is one plus tangent squared of theta equals the secant squared of theta, okay? And the final one that we're gonna go through is the cot cotangent squared of theta plus one equals the cosecant squared of theta. So now they've covered all three of the reciprocal ones, right? Here's the secant, cotangent, cosecant. So they're all three here in some form. The identities are reviewed at the top of page 53, right here. So this is important to remember, right? For all defined values of theta, it says. So let's take a look at a couple examples. If theta is in quadrant one and the cosecant of theta is five thirds, find the cotangent of theta, okay? Well, 
Of our identities, where do we have the cotangent and the cosecant the same? This is the identity, right? Cotangent squared of theta plus one equals the cosecant squared of theta. And then they solve, right? They square their five thirds and get 25th ninths, 25 ninths, subtract one in the form of nine over nine, okay? So 25 minus nine is 16. So now we have 16 ninthuses. We take the square root, which gives us plus or minus four over three. But we have to think we're in quadrant one. Cotangent is going to be positive, so we don't need the negative part. It's just positive four thirds. Okay, so make sure you're watching your signs. All of them are positive in quadrant one, so it, our answer is positive. For this example, it says find the sine of theta if theta is in quadrant three. So already we know the sine is negative and the cosine of theta is negative four fifths. Well, I kind of blocked it out here, but sine squared plus cosine squared equals one, right? So that's the identity that they're going to use. Cosine squared plus sine squared of theta equals one. They do that, they subtract the cosine from both sides. One turns into 25 over 25. They get nine over 25, take the square root plus or minus three over five. The sine in quadrant three is negative, so it's the negative three over five. Okay, so watch our signs. For this example here, it says simplify. And obviously, like any other simplification, we want to get it down to its simplest terms. We have secant squared a minus one minus tangent squared a. So what we want to do is look at our identities. Do we have identities that has a secant squared and a tangent squared? And we do, okay? The identity is tangent squared plus one equals sequence, secant squared. So if we rearrange that, okay, and we subtract a tangent from both sides, we get that one is equal to secant squared minus tangent squared, which we have here, secant squared, tangent squared. So if we rewrite our original thing that we're trying to simplify as secant squared minus tangent squared minus one, then we can substitute in for this a one, right? Because we know that secant squared minus tangent squared equals one. So we substitute in a one. One minus one is equal to zero. So simplified, the answer is zero. All right? So we're using our ident identities to simplify these terms, trying to get it to as a simple a term as we can. And that usually involves canceling things out, which is what they did here, right? They substituted here, which allowed them to put a one in, and then it basically canceled out and became a zero. They're not all going to become zeros, um, but we want it to get to simplest terms. Sometimes that means we only have one trigonometric function happening instead of two, right? This one started with two and ended up zero, but sometimes we'll start with two and we can get it down to just one, which then is it's in its simplest form. Okay, all right, let's turn the page and do some of these. Starting on page 54 with problem number 26, they want us to evaluate cosine squared of theta for cosine of theta equals the square root of three over two. Well, cosine squared of theta is just going to be the square of square root of three over two, okay? Which is going to be oops, squared, right? The square root of three squared is just three. Two squared is four. So our answer is three fourths. All right, over here on page 55, we're gonna take a look at number 30. Simplify the expression sine squared x plus sine x plus cosine squared x minus one. Okay, that's what they're giving us. They want us to simplify that. Well, from our identities, we know that sines sorry, sine squared, and I'm not going to put the x and the theta in, we understand what's happening, plus cosine squared is equal to one. So if we group these two things together, we can substitute in a one. And then we have sine of x plus one 
because that's what we substituted, minus one, plus one minus one becomes a zero, and we're just left with sine of x, letter A, okay? Let's do another one. Simplify the expression one half times the quantity negative sine squared of x minus cosine squared of x. All right, so I am going to pull out that negative. So we have negative one half times the sine squared uh, plus cosine squared, right? Now we know that this is one. We just, that's the identity right here, right? So one times negative one half is a negative one half and the answer is B, okay? So that's how we are simplifying these. Go ahead and finish the rest on your own. As always, if any questions come up or if you're not sure how to handle a topic, do not hesitate to contact me. Otherwise, until next time.